Hi there, my name is Marissa and we are here in one of the senior design labs for electrical and computer engineering here at Boston University. And for the past year, uh, myself along with four of my teammates have designed and constructed the Smart Grid Test Facility. So the Smart Grid Test Facility is an educational tool for engineering students, uh, teaching them about the power grid, how it works, how the various components interact with each other. And so it's meant for in-classroom experiences whether it's going to a lab, going to a demonstration, really something that can be wheeled into the class for the day and brought out at the end of the lab section or the class. And so we've tried to model all the core elements of a power grid. So that is generation, transmission, loads, and data acquisition, which is how we monitor what's going on along our power grid. So overall, we really hope that students have fun with our small scale power grid and are able to learn about how various elements work. Um, and we also hope that we can inspire them to study the power grid, maybe pursue a career in it. We know there are many challenges associated with the aging grid infrastructure, and also challenges that come along uh, with trying to integrate renewable energy technologies on the grid. And we really hope that with this system, we can introduce students to the power grid right away as, uh, in the classroom uh, and hope that they pursue it further. So we're here today to talk to you about how the grid works, uh, how its components work together, and we hope that you enjoy. So generation is really where our whole system starts. It's what produces all of the power that we need on the grid. So we wanted to make multiple generators that all feed into our power grid at the same time. So we have three total generators. Two of them we built mechanically out of a motor that spins an alternator. Uh, the motor is a DC motor, which using a, uh, a belt over the shaft spins a wind turbine alternator. That alternator outputs 60 hertz power at about 17 volts RMS, which we step down to 12 volts peak to peak. And that's sort of our nominal voltage for the whole system. So as you can see, we have generator A and generator B. So generator A and generator B are enclosed in a safety housing. Uh, that way when the system is operating, things are spinning fast, no one can accidentally touch it or kick it or anything like that. We do have ventilation on the sides uh, just for some airflow. And we can access the generators on both sides of the cart. Um, and so as you can see, two separate generators. The black ones are the DC motors. Over a belt, they spin uh, the wind turbine alternators, which are the red ones right here and right there. And that output is stepped down with the transformer uh, up to the top, which is where our interactive grid happens. And finally, down here, um, also to mention, we have some bracketing, uh, and just the overall safety enclosure was meant to make this project really visual, um, but also safe. Everything is uh, well held down, uh, so that way nothing kind of falls apart as we're running. Finally, a rotary encoder, which I'll talk about in just a bit. The reference generator is there as our third generation source, and it's really just a step-down transformer from the wall. So it's a variable transformer, which allows students in the future to be able to alter the nominal voltage of the system, maybe change some other elements. But it outputs, for now, the 12 volts peak-to-peak -peak that we use for our nominal voltage, so it matches the same voltage as the two other generators that we built mechanically. So together, those serve as our three generation points, uh, which at the same time feed into our power grid. So frequency stability is something that is really vital to our project. So as our three generators are operating and as we change things along the power grid, we want frequency to stay stable. So in order to make sure that that happens, we've implemented a feedback control loop on both of our mechanical generators separately. And what it does is it constantly is checking the frequency of the alternator and making sure that it's at 60 hertz. So the way that we've implemented that is all is visible on here on the middle shelf of the cart. As I mentioned earlier, we have rotary encoders on the shafts of the alternator. And what they do is they provide information to our MSP430. And what that does is it can tell how far away from 60 hertz the alternator is. And based on that information, it can feed a buck converter uh, up or down, which then feeds the motor. And overall, the feedback loop continues. So the MSP430 is really the brains of our system, and it's there to check how far away deviated from 60 hertz each alternator is separately, which is why we have A and B. 
We left them on the launch pad uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, students are required at BU to take circuit theory, uh, and during that class they learn all about electronics and also use a launch pad for really their first experience with a microcontroller. And so we wanted that there so that students were familiar with it, and also if they'd like to edit any of the code, make it do something slightly different, they certainly can. Uh, it's very approachable for them, it's really in a state that they're used to, uh, and also we we really thought that um, it makes the system modular. So any kind of replacements anyone needs to do or would like to change the project, they absolutely can. And as we'll show in just a bit, the reset buttons play a really vital component uh, for initiating power flow in our project. Uh, finally, just as um, one other extra feature, we have these frequency modulation buttons, uh, which allow you to slightly increase or decrease the frequency of the alternators, um, which can be really, really helpful in synchronization, which we'll talk about next. Uh, but overall, feedback control runs on these two generators and is intended to keep our frequency stable, which is exactly what it does. So we've talked about synchronization quite a bit, and synchronization is really important for us as we're trying to get three totally isolated generators feeding a power grid at the same time. So we need to make sure that our waveforms are in phase before we can just combine the generators together. So we've made synchronization circuits to do just that. The synchronization circuits are intended to be a really visual way for students to see synchronization happening and to do it themselves. And so that's what this circuit is right here. On one end, it's connected to the existing grid network, and on the other end, it's connected to the generator that we're trying to synchronize to the rest of the grid. So what happens is this LED experiences the combination of the waveforms between the existing grid and the generator we're running onto the grid. So when the LED is very dim, we know that the line-to-line -line voltage between them is zero, and the generators are in phase, at which point we can close in the generator using a toggle switch. This is a really visual way for students to experience synchronization. It's a similar method to what is used in actual power systems. So we have one of these on each generator input, and when we demo the project in just a minute, uh, we'll be able to see them in action. So transmission lines are what propagate power along our grid. Uh, we have them set up in a delta configuration with generation points at each corner and we have PCBs of transmission lines along each branch. And in doing this, we really wanted to model real grid characteristics of transmission lines. So we did a lot of research and calculated exact RLC values for these different line lengths uh, via their per unit characteristics. And we've modeled them um, as lumped element components as RLCs. So we have our PCBs for a transmission line, as shown right here. As you can see, we have a matrix configuration. So in each corner uh, is a different transmission line length. Um, so their RLC characteristics are scared, scaled accordingly. We have 10 miles, 25, 25, and 50. And using these switches, you can change what total length that you're trying to simulate. So for example, right now, via the green tabs, you can see that the top line is turned on. So you have a 10 plus 25, a 35 mile line simulated. So you can go across on each branch, we can go up and over. Uh, there are a lot of different configurations that you can make. Um, these inductors are hand wound. Um, also our resistors, capacitors, and inductors are all rated at about 2 amps. Um, our system really in normal operations does not reach that current level, uh, but for safety reasons uh, we've, we've made the standards quite a bit higher. So this is our transmission line PCB. Uh, we have three of them total, like I said, one on each branch, and they're meant to model real grid transmission lines. So while using our power grid, we really want students to be able to interact with different types of loads, because there are different types of loads on the real power grid. So in doing that, we've made resistive, inductive, and capacitive loads, all of which are variable. So while running the system, you're going to have your inductive load box connected, and you can change via these switches the equivalent inductance of this load. We have the same setup for both resistance and capacitance. And these are used for students who are operating the system real time who can connect loads to the transmission lines and using our data acquisition system see the changes in waveforms, see the changes in power flow and power factor. 
finally, we included with our project an LED load. Uh, we are from Boston. We love our Sitco sign, uh, so we decided to model that one as well. Um, this one we appreciate in part because it is very visual. So if you model an outage, if you cut a transmission line, uh, you will see a change in power flow. Uh, you may cut, fl cut flow to this completely, uh, and that way you can really see what the impacts are of outages uh, and changes along your transmission network. So we built a power grid, great. Um, we really want students to be able to see what's going on electrically. Uh, so we need students to be able to see voltage and current and learn about things like power factor uh, and phase angle. And so we designed these sensor boards, um, which are used throughout the entire grid, wherever you'd like. Uh, the project comes with a handful of them. And really what they do is they measure voltage and current. Uh, and using MATLAB via LabJack can calculate things like phase angle and power factor. Um, and what they do is they connect uh, really anywhere you'd like along the grid using these connectors. They can connect between transmission lines with the input to a generator, between a load and a transmission line, and really that way students can very clearly see what's going on at that point along the grid. They can run these at multiple points all at the same time, and like I said, using MATLAB can observe the waveforms. So in the design of these sensor boards, we used quite a few TI components that were really vital to the functionality of these boards in the project altogether. So that included several op-amps, uh, including TL084s and TL082s, and also a voltage regulator. Uh, and as the project comes with a handful of these, we used quite a few of those components. And we really appreciate how seamless uh, they made that whole process of design. And as you can see in our schematics, they really were an integral part of the entire sensor network. So to show this project in action, the exciting part, uh, we've put together a quick clip of us using the project together, uh, the five of us running and operating the project as a typical student or group of students might do in the classroom. So in doing that, we've shown generation, transmission, loads, and also a quick view of data acquisition as well. Smart grid test facility, we're going to start off by turning on the reference generator and then the 24 volt DC supply. Then turn on generator A by pressing the button on the MSP, and we also have the option to change the alternator frequency. Then we'll sync the two waveforms when the peaks match. We'll do the same thing for generator B. And when the line-to-line -line voltage is equal to zero, the LED should turn dark. Now we can connect loads into the transmission network. Or we can connect loads through the sensor boards into the transmission network. From the sensor boards, we can then get voltage and current characteristics in addition to calculate the phase between voltage and current. So we hope you enjoyed our, our quick video about our project. Uh, like we said, it's an educational tool and we really, really hope that students have a lot of fun in the classroom using our project, learning about the grid, maybe inspiring them to study it further as they move on in their career as an engineer. So at the end of the day, we had a lot of fun working on this and we really want to thank a lot of the faculty and students and mentors who helped us here at BU uh, and also really across the industry who were incredibly helpful. So thank you so much for watching. Um, moving forward, we're really interested in incorporating things like smart grid technologies as our project title suggests, as we may incorporate um, some more communication devices, uh, also a few more ways to make it a little more modular for students. Um, so again, thank you so much for watching and we hope you liked it.